He's the chairman of Microsoft Africa. But before Sheikh Jara started strolling the corridors of this technology giant, he worked for NASA as their first African astrophysicist. Working at NASA has done a great thing for me in this sense that I wanted the youth of Africa to realize that your potential really is unlimited. It depends on you. This week on African Voices, we speak to Sheikh Jara about his journey from a farming community in Sago, Mali, to two of the world's most powerful organizations. Jara has been the chairman of Microsoft Africa since 2006, but it was not for his expertise in computers that Bill Gates employed him, but rather his knowledge of Africa and how things work here that landed this United Nations Goodwill Ambassador the Microsoft position. This is a unique opportunity because somebody like me who is known for uh, his scientific achievement, uh, being able to have the opportunity to use, to leverage a company like Microsoft to really put technology uh, access issue at the middle of the table. You know, how do we access technology in Africa? When I say access, I'm talking about the affordability of hardware and software as well as the connectivity issues, having electrical socket in our rural area which doesn't exist, but principally training people to even be able to use the machine if one day they can access to it. You know, being able to, uh, from the chairman position of Microsoft, create a consortium with other companies such as HP and others to be able to see how, from our different perspective, we can bring uh, to the table some approach that will enable to make this access issue a reality so that we can finally give access to the huge number of Africans to this technology. What are you doing to well, improve you, accessibility? You take, for example, South Africa. We have given software to South Africa education system for free. For Is free. that not trying to lock them into Microsoft? We don't lock anybody. Microsoft. I mean, you gotta be, uh, you got to know what you want. On the one hand, you write your software. If you, you give it to people, they say you are locking them in. If you don't give it to people, they say it's too expensive. I mean, we, have, we are a company who is making product. We are on the market to actually be able to make money because the quality of our product and the fact that people use them. Now, based on that, we cannot be unhappy if some people are using us all, but you can never lock anybody onto anything. What are you doing to deal with piracy, for example, that's estimated to be costing about 150 million in Northern Africa alone? My opinion is that the best way to fight piracy is to help develop the local software industry. Once you take a company, a small company, and you transfer the know-how to that small company, you help that company grow. So having small companies, software companies, who are going to deal with the direct need of the people around them and developing a software to respond to those people's need and eventually thinking about identifying those needs somewhere worldwide and us coming and helping those people develop and those people growing their market share, paying taxes to their own government, hiring people that they pay, then people will start seeing the value in respecting intellectual property. On a continent where poverty is one of the biggest barriers to technology, open source software has the potential to increase the number of people who are able to use computers. According to the New York Times, more than 10 million people are currently using South African IT billionaire Mark Shuttleworth's Ubuntu, a potential threat to Microsoft's growth strategy in Africa. But Jara argues that nothing is really given for free. In fact, it is not a matter of free, it is a matter of business model. I can give you right now 
a software for free. But every time you use that software and you need me to help you with part of the code or whatever, then I charge you. That's a business model. I charge you for my time to explain you how to use it. Or I can sell you a software up front. You pay me. And then for a certain number of years, you can use that software whenever you have any kind of problem. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you call me, your call is free, I will walk you through it. It is just two business models that are different. But you have a network on the internet where people can get that help for free. Well, that is another model. It, everything is model, you know. But the thing is this, you know, I personally think that in Africa, uh, Africa has to take advantage of everything, you know open source software, proprietary. And this is why every time I talk to decision makers, I tell them, you know, you guys are in a wrong fight. Your fight is not a fight to take position uh, for open source or for proprietary. Your fight is to require all the software writers to write codes with interoperability embedded in it. So that means if I take an open source software today because it does my job, it has to be able to work with the software that I have bought that might not be in a free market that I bought. They got to work together. And this is the kind of thing that we need to demand of software right? is interoperability so that that will give us the flexibility where we can and where it is available to get software for free or at least cheap or to get software that is not free but that works very well and put the two together to work. That's one small step for man. After the break. I've been uh, interested in what NASA does since uh, the time I was in uh, secondary school uh, when in 1969 uh, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin landed on the moon.